20 Rules for Friends, a guide to online discourse. It's a common observation that the right has organizational problems. In fact, working in this space for some time, I've noticed two arrayed in opposition to each other, like Scylla and Charybdis. First, we have the problem with fraud. Being the anti-establishmentarian force in the 21st century, the right is a popular target for opportunists for people who want to make a name for themselves as guardians of the status quo, against the dangerous forces of radicalization. Being an active subverter of the right-wing community through misrepresentation and vilification can be a lucrative career choice. But in a more mundane sense, there's also the garden-variety grifter, the people who just want to ride the outrage cycle without moving forward, those who push every distraction and drama to juice out maximum clicks, and who are ever so willing to punch to the right the second it can increase their brand profile. Everyone knows this is a problem, and that the right needs to do better, dig deeper, and impose some common-sense gatekeeping. But it's just at the point of application of this common-sense gatekeeping that the other foot drops. We fall into the Caribbean pit of purity spiraling. Anyone who has been in an online right-wing space will know this problem all too well. Since there is no common ideology that unifies the right, no institutional force, no emergent power driving spontaneous self-organization, the right is forced to define itself broadly in the negative, as oppositional towards the mainstream. Of course we know this is insufficient. We all know we need a deeper belief and a more specific moral and religious vision. However, any attempt to enforce such a standard on a distant space generally will cut an individual off from 99% of other people similarly active in opposing mainstream power. At the extremes, the pure believer, living in principle, in most ordinary circumstances, will remain a singleton, a point of opposition, in despair against the greater world. The real beneficiary of these circumstances is the establishment, and the army of grifters making money off selling outrage. Atomized people are easy to control and subvert generally. They buy more outrage porn. They fuel pointless social media battles and they lash out in spectacularly ineffective ways, which, of course, fuels the radicalism of the other side. But is there an alternative? Can we build some kind of healthy community of dissidents? Can we de-atomize people to come together with an eye towards opposing the corrosive forces of modernity and building a social order focused on humanity's spiritual and physical health? To put the issue a different way, one might say that any anti-progressive force in the modern world faces two obstacles— the first to build quality community and trust, the second to avoid succumbing to cancellation and the general entropy of the progressive mainstream. Each of these concerns tends to pull in opposite directions, which is exploited by our enemies to frustrate our efforts towards growth. Navigating these dual objectives presents a riddle for any distant group to find the fine line between moral enforcement and political viability. Probably everyone has their own answer to this riddle, but this is my attempt 20 Rules for Allies, or as we say online, Friends. First, a disclaimer. These rules are largely discourse-based and concern relationships that are purely dialectic. In a sense, these rules characterize what some people call loose alignment with the broad dissident movement. Therefore, these rules are much looser than the set of best practices that should be taken to in-real-life relationships where the goal is to build long-term trust in real communities. These roles also do not address the ultimate vision that should guide the improvement of long-lasting human communities going forward. Largely, any organic community would have to possess a specific religious and cultural ethos, so that no generalized rule could ever be formed. But with that disclaimer, on to the list. Rule 1. A friend believes in humanity and a higher power. We have to start here. There is no such thing as value-neutral politics. Of course, politics is fundamentally about coalition building, friend-enemy, and we want to keep the standards of community general. But I don't think we can get more general than humanity's two essential political priorities. One, preserving humanity's survival in post-modernity, and two, sustaining humanity's relationship with God. Without these two political priorities, there can be no cooperation. Perhaps we could make these standards more general by replacing God with truth, goodness, and beauty, but the point would remain more or less the same. 
The right is the party of human survival and human thriving. This requires dedication both to humanity itself and to some higher moral order. Therefore, in this task, we may have a common cause with some deists, agnostics, and atheists, but we have no common cause with nihilists. We can't trust them. Rule 2. Friends recognize liberal modernity's threat to human thriving and desire a new direction to ensure humanity's survival. Putting a finer point on the matter, what is the subject of the right's political activism? This can be summarized negatively as an opposition to the current global order of government-managed technocracy. This system, in its present form, sacrifices long-term human thriving for short-term solvency in power, pushing out older, life-giving traditions, and displacing people in order to replace them with the false promises of endless growth in consumer-driven lifestyles. Although very few people at this stage don't see that the modern world is in a state of crisis, still, what characterizes the real right, those on the right side of the red pill, is the understanding that these problems go back to the core of late secular modernity's presuppositions, if not the Enlightenment itself. There is no going back to the 1990s. There is no return to fresh prints, or even the 1950s. Whatever the problem is, it's now buried deep across multiple generations, and any reversal will require a radical change and break with the status quo. Rule 3. Friends understand that boundaries are a core mechanism to foster independence and health in the face of modern society. Overwhelmingly, most people concerned with human well-being are aware of modernity's corrosive effect and understand that independence from the system is a necessary component of human survival. To accomplish independence, dissident groups seek boundaries and separation from the whole, either morally, geographically, or politically. As such, regardless of the differences between the various groups sitting under the dissident umbrella, we are all unified in our common value of independent association, for the sake of our own conscience and humanity's broader survival. In this way, also, various different dissident friend groups share a common enemy in the global managerial class, which, for reasons thoroughly described by Bertrand de Juvenal, is always interested in humanity's deconstruction and homogenization to further push the boundaries of managerial power. It is this central struggle against homogenization and centralization that characterizes virtually all near-term goals of dissident politics. Rule 4. Friends make promises and keep them. Friends are capable of receiving loyalty and giving it. So far, my list has been negative. Are there any positive qualities of friends? Let's start with the most basic right-wing value, making and keeping promises. If the left wing is antinomian, entropic, or focused on the politics of dissolving bonds, the right, by contrast, must be focused on the creation and sustenance of bonds, starting with trust and the keeping of promises. There's no way we can make it through modernity without being true to each other, and we can't be true to each other without being true to our word. Make promises, keep them, and always be loyal. In many ways, I see this aspect as both the right wing's end and means, or at least where its ends and means meet. What people understand now is that there is no slacktivism from the right. There is no way that politics can be an entertainment product and still be serious about the future. Maximizing pleasure, parasocial fake relationships, and illusory comfort are the left's game, and they will always win that contest. For the right to win, we need something more. We need real trust and real relationships, which means real kept promises. Rule 5. Friends make their moral commitments explicit. No functional nihilism, no view from nowhere. If the base of a distant position is trust or promise-keeping, what is the superstructure that binds it together? What is the fundamental dialectic tool that links such a diverse and disparate group of people together, allowing them to communicate? In short, this is formalism. We say what we mean, we mean what we say. We express what we believe and our own moral boundaries in concise and clear language. And we don't use functional nihilism and pure critique to score cheap wins against rival parties. Immediately, it should be obvious to see the practical utility of formal commitments and beliefs. 
You can't have boundaries or borders without clear lines. You can't have an actual conversation without clear language. You can't have understanding without clear meaning. This is why basic, simple beliefs are often the most important. The principles that you can communicate and the moral lines around which you constrain your behavior and allegiance. All in all, we should strive to be clear with our beliefs. Mystery cults are not good. But generally, explicitly stated principles should be a practical prerequisite for people working together in a diverse coalition. Men need to express their commitments explicitly, first so they can be respected, but also so that the position of pure critique cannot be used maliciously to deconstruct a genuine beliefs while never defending a positive solution. This was the problem with the new atheist movement and virtually all modern movements on the left. The view from nowhere always sounds smart, defeats any other position in a debate, yet it does little more than drive back biting drama and create a race to the bottom towards moral cynicism. Rule 6. Friends make an effort to understand other friends' core loyalties. There's nothing that I respect more than a true believer, and I understand the need to insulate yourself from other ideas that might be alien, heretical, or would otherwise feed the fuel of doubt inside your own mind and soul. However, we are building a broad coalition that needs to work together, and being a leader means not being insulated from ideas that might be foreign or hostile. We need to know ourselves and know our enemies, but know our allies no less, because this is key for establishing boundaries, order, and peace. Pretty simple concept, but sometimes hard to execute. Just remember to keep asking questions. Always assume that conflict with other allies is due to a misunderstanding, and try to intellectualize disagreements to minimize their impact. The last thing we want is an ever-escalating holy war in our own ranks, while we stand divided against the more existential threats of modernity. Rule 7. Friends respect other friends' boundaries, even if those boundaries exclude them. A related note, but one that is qualitatively different. We need to respect each other's boundaries. Is this too obvious after the previous two points about why we make boundaries in the first place? Perhaps, but here I want to address the more emotional elephant in the room, the issue of discrimination and exclusion. I know that we are all post-leftists. We all know that any real human community must include a dimension of exclusion. But when the discrimination cuts against you, in the moment, you might forget this eternal truth and relapse into shitlib spurgery. In the immortal words of Marcellus Wallace, that's pride fucking with you. We need to be adults about this. Of course, everyone is justified in being concerned that others might be conspiring against their own interest. But not every space is for you. Not every context is suited for your presence. Adults understand the necessity to respect certain boundaries of religion and ethnicity, but also the necessity of certain boundaries of age and lifestyle. For instance, I can admit to myself here that at my age I will never be cool. I can offer wisdom for what it is, but my temperament is totally unsuited for the more posh and urban circles. Knowing these types of limitations, and being at peace with them, is the first step towards not being a spurg. Rule 8. Friends always attempt to de-escalate drama and dissolve disagreements. So now that we have established our task is to build order in life, let's talk about the enemy of order, chaos. Chaos is an expansive spiritual concept, but the most common way it enters into human communities is through politics, or what we oftentimes call politics in more personal situations, drama. Drama is the cause of most of the problems on social media, but also the driver of all the clout, which, if we are honest, is a major reason why any of us do this stuff to begin with. This leads to the phenomenon of the internet of beefs, there really is nothing better for your own personal profile than to start random conflicts and drama online, but there is really nothing worse for the community or building anything lasting for the future. Anyone who's been doing this for any amount of time will recognize the issue. It is amazing how thoroughly petty personal disputes destroy communities. Even in the last year, so many bonds brought together through massive efforts and expensive organization were torn apart by the drama on Twitter. It's tragic when you think about it, but that's how human psychology works. The internet is driven by effeminate fighting. But real things only come from masculine concordance in real life. For this reason, it is imperative for all community members, 
content creators in particular, to de-escalate drama whenever possible. Try to intellectualize disagreements, unravel and dissolve disputes that don't lead anywhere, and focus always on productivity and expansion. Rule 9. Friends refrain from insulting core loyalties of other friends. But given that everyone knows drama is bad and leads to bad things, why does it erupt so frequently? One major reason is, again, not understanding or respecting verbal boundaries. We should remember here the notion of fighting words, expressions and statements that, when made, are rightfully perceived as a hostile attack on the object and require an escalation of the conflict, verbal or physical. There are certain fine lines that people should have been taught in school, the lines that surround a man's core loyalties. These obviously include deities or other direct focal points of religion, words describing God, people's children, wives, mothers, and families generally, and of course direct attacks on men's integrity or women's virtue. Back in the day, insulting these things landed you right into a fistfight or duel. On the internet, we can't enforce these boundaries, but let's respect the lessons that in-real-life interaction should have taught us. Rule 10. Friends maintain care around secondary loyalties. Okay, so maybe the core loyalties are clear no-go zones, but isn't there a large gray area for banter and locker room talk, for memes, for intellectual discussion? People can be a little more forgiving around identities and relationships that aren't directly sacred or personal. Still, we need to be careful. I do think a certain amount of mockery is allowable in the right context. When it comes to certain racial, religious, and national identities, these are what I call secondary loyalties. Loyalties that, while still critical, can be held more lightly because in most contexts, when not directly threatened by politics or war, they don't need to be directly defended and therefore can be joked about among friends. As Clint Eastwood in Gran Torino demonstrated, some light ethnic bigotry can be charming, in fact. And most racists don't care about what race you are, so long as you are racist, too. In the right context, of course. But due diligence is necessary. The proper relationship and demeanor need to be established. Be careful of testing these boundaries out in public spaces, unless it's very obviously a joke. Loyalties, even secondary ones, can start real fights. And also, steer clear of these areas altogether if some spectrum disorder prevents you from picking up on subtle context cues. Rule 11. Friends never punch right. No moral denouncements. This is a rule people know, but that needs quite a bit more explanation to execute properly. The left's tactic is divide and conquer. It is a slow ratchet that relies on conservatives providing outreach to their left and gatekeeping to their right. Each of these services, in turn, expands the horizon for the progressive movement while guarding its flank. Under these circumstances, Dissident's main problem is a mainstream right that can't do anything effective other than countersignal against its more principled members and facilitate a dialectic where they are always the default losers. And we experience the sharp end of this problem every time the boomer normicons pile on some ill-conceived cancellation campaign based on their enemy's own progressive sensibilities. Solution? Well, don't punch right. Simple as. But it's actually not that simple. The right still needs dialectic, moral boundaries, and intelligent discussion. Embracing the grug-brained version of don't punch right is a straight path towards purity spiraling and total community brain drain. It turns out that we don't actually want bigotry, sociopathy, or callousness just because it's based and on the right. But given that any moral enforcement internally causes a wedge that can be exploited by our enemies to dissolve the coalition, what can we do? Really, this is an extended conversation, but it begins with understanding how the left-wing cancellation cycle works. The leftist cancellation cycle operates by moralizing, smearing, and collectivizing a moral panic, casting all political differences as moral failings, moralizing, then vague language what I sometimes call magic words, are used to equivocate and magnify the panic, smearing. And finally, guilt by association is used to trigger mass denouncements. 
Essentially, not punching right comes down to arresting this process of cancellation at all stages while preserving the other elements of ordinary human moral policing and enforcement. We can start with the first stage of the cancellation process and address the issue of cynical moralization, or what some also call leftist concern trolling. This is a problem. We know there are divisions between those on the right, important religious divisions that represent morals we take seriously. However, this seriousness has to be held in line with the political reality of leftist subversion. The first step is to be aware of the moral direction of the left and the fads that it uses cynically for its own ends. Of course, an idea isn't wrong just because the progressive cathedral is promoting it. A broken clock is right two times a day. But you don't want to allow your enemy's momentary lapse of clarity to become a tool in your community's destruction. Therefore, we have to find a way of resolving moral conflicts internally. My preferred way of addressing this issue relies on a three-stage process that I like to call DIS. De-escalate, intellectualize, and separate. First, de-escalate. Make sure that you remove emotion and explicit attack on the honor of the allied individuals and communities. Second, intellectualize the problem by framing the disagreement as a contention over factual matters or some ethical contention. Frame the task properly, state the disagreement in a way your opponent agrees with, and develop a commonly understood list of what each side wants and the lines that each side can't cross. Finally, separate. Develop a space for each moral system to operate and rules that can prevent the disagreement from escalating further. To the extent that there is a disagreement over boundaries, seek arbitrage from a third party or higher authority. With this framework, political division can still be allowed, purity spiraling minimized without opening up too many cracks for progressive subversion. Rule 12. Friends avoid counter-signaling, jumping on cathedral bandwagons or cancellation campaigns. Here, we must address halting the next stage of the progressive cancellation process, the issue of smearing language. Again, anyone who spent a long time in the distant space is well aware of how mainstream conservatives play into this process. They become co-owners of the left's terminology, therefore they become the unwitting enforcers of the left's own moral system. As much as they complain about cancel culture, their actions are actually driving it. In short, the mainstream right is addicted to counter-signaling their own activist class. How do we stop this stupid counter-signaling? How do we stop the ratchet without falling into mere contrarianism? Here, I think the issue is actually pretty easy. Leftist linguistic smearing relies on a certain kind of tactical equivocation that I have called in the past magical words. These magical words are words with deep emotional and political consequences for those labeled with them, but with no specific meaning that can be consistently defined. As such, these words are just transport for the will of progressive power. Their enemies are always punished, their allies are always spared, with no ethical consistency or coherency required. How do we respond to these magical words? This is a hard nut to crack. Every now and again, dissidents can reclaim one of these magic words and use them effectively against the cathedral itself. But this is the exception and not the rule. For the most part, magical words, like the One Ring of Sauron, are owned by the power that created them. We need to avoid their use. Remember, while we form language, language also forms us. We think we can control it, but more often than not, we can't. So unless you're really confident in what you're doing, it is best to keep the black tongue of Mordor out of your mouth. As an aside, I can here list an example from my own online presence. Among right-wingers, I have from the beginning been rather outspoken in my feelings that race needs to be de-emphasized as far as possible. But still, I never use the word racism to describe my disagreement with others who want to emphasize the more ethnic dimensions of the crisis. Not only is the word rendered meaningless by equivocation, it is dangerous dialectic poison and a weapon that will eventually be used against me if I give it power. Rule 13. Friends make themselves strong enough to hold the line, or make room for those who can. And here, finally, is the last line of defense against the progressive cancellation cycle. 
which is no less than the last line of defense against any spiritual or physical attack. Fortitude. We need to hold the line. Bravery is essential, because so much of the left's cancel culture power is based on fear, the cascading nature of cancellations, where implied guilt by association triggers denouncement after denouncement. People are afraid. Afraid of losing their careers, their reputations, their relationships with family and friends. So they panic. They cave. They give in. But at some point, this has to stop. People need to stand up and speak up, take risks, expose themselves to criticism, and ignore the enemy's threats when they ask for another head to be delivered unto them. Look, we all need to manage our own exposure and privacy individually. We need to decide just how much we can give to this larger effort when there are other things in our lives, other people who rely on us. But that being said, there is a responsibility attendant when we step forward to represent our resistance and defend the community. Make yourself a point of strength. Don't throw others under the bus to be the good one. And don't betray those who put their trust in you because it's easier or better for your public profile. Don't let down the man standing next to you by retreating, then reframe the issue as self-care. This is a collective effort, and we have to take responsibility to stand with each other in times of crisis. Are these requirements too stringent to be met at this stage of your life? That's fine. Maybe it's time to sit out around, take a more subdued role in the project. There is plenty of work to be done behind the scenes, and plenty of other people waiting to take your place on the front lines. Rule 14. Friends always stay building. This is something that I've often said over the years. Always be building. But I think it's become clear, post-COVID, that there is just no victory to be run through clout and politics. Winning has to produce something. It can't just be winning for the sake of feeling like you're winning, so you can flex and feel good about yourself. We have to build the future we want. This means that all action taken inside the community has to leave something substantive behind you. More resources for other friends to use, better wisdom, broader networks, best practices and institutions that can facilitate the creation of new things, political or otherwise. A lot of people push back on Curtis Yarvin's later work, but one of his recent observations needs to be etched in stone. A victory is anything that makes future victories easier or more likely. Whenever you set your mind or will to accomplish something, begin with the end in mind. Ask, what does this produce? How does this make a better world, substantively, in the present, or make victories easier to produce in the future? With this in mind, we can stay focused on the real task ahead of us, creating order in life so that we can pass it down to our children and future generations. Rule 15. Friends never dox or harass non-institutional targets. Alright, so this is mostly just following the terms of service for most social media sites. But still, I think we need to understand the broader boundaries when it comes to cultural warfare. We don't want to attack non-combatants. We don't want to use valuable resources to spread the scope of war. As we try to achieve order, spreading chaos and terror is simply counterproductive. For this reason, friends do not dox, harass, or viciously attack private persons. As a Christian, I obviously believe that war has certain ethical boundaries that need to be respected. Certain things are off-limits to attack, but setting aside even this broader moral perspective, Prosecuting cultural total war is simply bad politics from a strictly Machiavellian perspective. As men of the right, we are agents of order, and order has to be both our end and our means. We need to represent in war the mode of rulership that we would want to live under in peace. That's how people begin to trust your promises. That's how people begin to follow your banner and believe in a better world. And as I want to remind people, this is a war of belief. Rule 16. Friends always pursue self-improvement. There is that constant refrain, become worthy than rule. It's become so often repeated that the words have become cliche and trite. Even the recommendations probably aren't very original here. Pursue excellence, physical, intellectual, familial, and spiritual. 
The right-wing Jim Bro culture is a win in and of itself. Still, in spite of what's gone before, I feel like I need to say something about the quest for improvement generally. This is something that a lot of older millennials will recognize, but wasn't the quest for self-improvement easier when we were younger? It's not just the material conditions or the physical reality of getting older. For my generation, the gradual decline in optimism was the deepest cut. During my youth, America and the West had a bright future ahead of them. Everything was on the up. When I improved myself, I was improving my future, improving the world, moving the boundaries and the prospects of humanity ever upwards. But now, in the middle of obvious and metastasizing decline, you can't improve faster than things are getting worse. No matter how much effort you put into things, you will never see macrocosmic progress. It's the Red Queen principle. You have to run fast, just to stand still. And no matter how much you improve, you won't overcome the downward slide of everything around you. In this context, I think there is a crisis of motivation among millennials. I'm not the only one who's noticed this, but after a point, my generation just sort of gave up. The natural pull at this stage is always towards regression. And to the extent that any of us don't want to be part of this problem, we need to fight this instinct of decline. In every context in which you strive, in every location where you live, there needs to be a constant movement towards betterment, towards improvement, and towards order. The rest of the world might be going to pot, but that does not change our own moral imperative. We need to be the tiny bubble of civilization inside a world of barbarism. We need to be the beacon of sanity inside clown world, the point of stability in a sea of chaos. Again, this is what necessarily differentiates us from our enemies. Sometimes people ask me the various ways a person can recognize good from evil, an ordered spiritual presence from a demonic one. Traditionally, this has had a very common answer. The sinful are chaotic, discordant, and two-faced. The holy are constant and stable in time. Pursue that constancy. Rule 17. Friends always expand the coalition and find new friends. Perhaps this is an extension of the previous rule, or simply a restatement of the core purpose of finding friends to begin with, but we are building a coalition. No one is yet naive enough to still believe in individualism in 2023, right? Winter is coming, times are dark, and we need to draw together. Enemies are expensive, friends are invaluable, and we need alliances everywhere to function in a globalized world. Sometimes, I think there is some resistance to this more unifying direction by some very online types. There's a type of person who likes disrupting things and creating drama because they want to be a big fish in a small pond. In this regard, growth can be threatening to ego and clout. But hopefully, after everything we have seen, we have come past this more juvenile way of thinking. We need to grow or die, so it's time to get to work. Rule 18. Friends give and receive constructive criticism. Speaking of egos, another necessary component of survival will be humility. The ability to take criticism. We can't improve unless we sustain disagreement, obviously, but we also can't improve unless we receive direct personal criticism, no matter how painful that might be. This is obviously easier said than done, Speaking as a content creator who has essentially poured an enormous amount of his life into this movement, there's nothing I hate more than having an anonymous Twitter troll tell me I haven't worked hard enough, and I don't think any productive conversations have ever been started by moral posturing. Really, prudence is needed. If you want to communicate a need to improve or a helpful suggestion, reach out in private. Even better if this can be communicated in person. In all likelihood, you'll need to build a relationship before anything real can be accomplished. But I suppose also there is a reciprocal side of things. Content creators, in particular, need to keep their egos in check. We need to remember that we aren't bigger men just because we have bigger voices on social media. We are just teachers, servants, and servants need to listen and obey. Rule 19. Friends forgive mistakes when asked. We've already discussed several marks of the evil, chaotic temperament, lack of constancy, and an inability to build. Let's discuss another, the inability to extend forgiveness. People don't talk about this a lot on the right wing, but the ability to forgive is not only a sign of goodness, 
but also a sign of strength. Its absence is a sign of evil and a sign of weakness. When I myself was a progressive, the complete inability of powerful leftists to conceptualize true reconciliation is one of the first truly evil things I noticed about the movement. Really, this lack of forgiveness occurred gradually in progressives as a product of their own cultural degeneration. But this degeneration must be arrested in our own case. Of course, there is the need for justice. I need to hold people accountable. But more often than not, these instincts that well up inside of us are born out of pride and vindictiveness and not a genuine pursuit of righteousness. Again, the internet has been a large part of bringing this bad element out in people. But also remember to put yourself in your opponent's shoes. We are all in this mess together. We are all part of the problem. We are all the misbegotten children of the modern evil. If we can come through it all, with all of our own flaws and sins, and still call ourselves good enough to be part of the solution, why can't we extend this life-giving charity to our own rivals? Rule 20. Friends know others by their fruits. Finally, and most succinctly, there's no replacement for genuine quality, genuine virtue, and genuine goodness. As Christ himself said, we know who is worthy of following, by the goodness they leave to the world. This is an instruction as much as it is a warning. Remember to observe people in their actions. See what they sacrifice for and how they conduct themselves, in their words, in their interactions online, and more importantly, in their comportment in the real world. No institution is better than the people who make it up. No law or constitution is stronger than the promises of those who write it, pledge allegiance to it, and fight in its name. If this movement is to succeed and accomplish anything, it must rely on the virtues and loyalties of the people who make it up. And as such, we must seek goodness and virtue in others, and cultivate it in ourselves. For a while, I believe this temporal goodness will be enough to sustain us. But as things may grow darker, we will need to reach for higher things. Piety, holiness, sainthood, It's a daunting proposition, but not a task we need to pursue alone. We have the help of God and, God willing, the help of friends.